So, our, uh, our final speaker this session is uh, Donald Paddy McCarthy from Infinium Technologies, Senior Verification Engineer. Um, Paddy's been talking to me about Python for 10 years and his day has come, I think. Um, <laughs> he's been speaking about Python for verification. Um, he's a Senior Verification Engineer at Infinium Technologies in Bristol. During his 18 years there, he has created verification flows for several projects, helped introduce the use of Linux workstations to the company, supported complex multi-site project configurations, created a faster ranking algorithm, and a novel RTL fault simulator for div diversity testing and use in ISO 26262 compliance. Before this, Paddy managed an engineering team, created bespoke simulation accelerator models. In his spare time, Donald uh, Paddy strives to be a polite Python advocate. I'm not sure about the polite Paddy. An online problem solver and thinks that mass is fun. Anyway, controversial. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am a verification engineer. I'm an engineer, but I do do software as well. Oops, sorry. You just press the wrong button. Try again. 20 minutes isn't long to say much about Python, but what I want to do is to get people involved enough to actually go out there and say hello to the groups and find out a bit more about Python and Jupyter Framework. Uh, I thought I'd tell you a bit about me, what I know about programming and why I've switched to Python. Um, I've, I've been programming for a long time. 1975, when the deck minis and basic were the only things there before uh, home computers. Um, I sneaked into a course and uh, learned it. Uh, they didn't kick me out. Um, I've programmed every, ever since. Uh, I've never been employed as a programmer, which means that the programming I do, I can kind of own it. <laughs> um, I've programmed in a lot of languages. Um, Skill, C, Pascal, BCPL, I don't do anymore. Um, I still um, use all Perl, Python, TCL, Verilog, VHDL, and more. Um, I first found, about, found out about Python in 1995. I went to a company that, were, uh, that had started to use Perl, and it didn't sit well. Uh, I searched around, and uh, people were starting on Python, this new thing. Um, I'm now a member of the Python Software Foundation. Uh, I've been answering Python problem, um, questions and problems and blogs and Stack Overflow and Reddit and stuff for ages. Uh, I've got a blog that's mainly, mainly Python, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, I've always been a self-taught program. In, and at the turn of the century, there's a lot of um, um, heated debate about CompSci versus Home Trained. Um, but I've done a lot of um, programming. Um, I could have written a book on Python, but there's just too many out there. Uh, they're very good ones that are just free to download. Uh, there's a website that uh, I think eight years ago was saying that they had 300 tutorials on Python. Um, I didn't want to join that. <laughs> it's, it's overdone. So I looked around, and there was an open source site called rosettacode.org. Um, and that's that allows the languages to be compared by having them all implementing the same task. You get a task, and then there'll be a C solution, um, a Python solution, Perl solution. You know, um, there's, there's much more than 870 tasks, and uh, there's around 600 uh, programming languages. Not every programming language um, um, goes after every task, but um, we get people like uh, Larry Wall uh, when he's doing Perl 6. He mm -hmm. and his team did a lot of the tasks on Rosetta Code because it allowed them to check out what, what, what they're doing with a new uh, language. And so we get a lot of that. Um, I've written a lot of the tasks and the Python solutions. Um, and I have to write good Python because uh, it's an open source thing. You know, if, if it's wrong, then you get to know about it. So, Python. It's a community. That's what I like, most like about Python. It's a community, um, and it counts a lot. Uh, it's how we develop the language, uh, and it's how people tend to stay in Python and don't move on. They, they like the community. Uh, it's open source. Um, 
I guess to, to some um, programming people, uh, it, it's a spec with several implementations, not rather than say Perl, which is an implementation, it's a spec. And so we have uh, the C Python interpreter, um, what you most know, um, but we've also got PyPy, which is a just-in-time compiler, and Number, uh, which is a just in, another just-in-time compiler. Um, we've got interpreters written um, for the .NET environment and the Java uh, JVM as well. And, and what's good about those is that uh, um, it, they, they, they make it very easy to uh, access um, .NET and uh, JVM uh, classes from uh, those Python environments. Uh, we've even got MicroPython, uh, which uh, works on bare bones hardware. Um, BBC Microbit has it, and that's smaller than a Raspberry Pi, much smaller than Raspberry Pi. So uh, we try to get um, uh, involvement from uh, all, all people. Uh, it's interpreted, which I think is a very good thing. Um, it means that you get instance response, and when you actually um, looking for an answer, having an interpreter means that uh, it's a lot easier to explore. Um, it's strongly typed. It's not like most um, scripting languages. It is strongly typed, and it's dynamically typed. Uh, it can now be what's called manifestly typed, which means that you can say that um, you want this variable to have only strings in for example, but it's only a hint. There are checks for those hints, but it's a, it's a sock to the Java people and stuff, the static language people, but it works. Um, you can get um, MyPy um, uh, working within a PyCharm IDE to give you a lot of what the static language uh, aficionados like about statically typed languages, but it is a scripting and my word, it's replicious. It's got a re-evaluate print loop. Uh, some, well, a lot of more languages do have it, but um, it's used a hell of a lot. In TCL, in, um, you, you tend to use the re-evaluate print loop um, a, lot more, a, lot, a lot as well, but the, a lot of languages that say they have it don't tend to have examples of it around and people don't tend to use it. They tend to write a file and then go execute the file. Um, but a good way of um, um, I've found of writing Python is to write and, and use it within the um, the, the, the REPL. Um, that's been the original REPL has been um, uh, has been worked on, uh, and now there's other versions like uh, IPython uh, used within the, the Spider IDE, and uh, now there's uh, Jupyter Lab, which is bloody great thing it, it's um it just won the acm award for software and um it's an environment which allows you to use um all the ai uh, and stats tools that uh, you might have heard about python in verification there have there are people that wrap c models of their ip in python so that um, it allows them to reconfigure the system with um, Python rather than having to go back to back and uh, recompile. Um, if you've wrapped um, your C models, you can put by Python between um, the uh, ports to get coverage and um, do other things like that. Um, and you can reconfigure your system um, interactively to explore what ifs. Um, I've also used it to uh, do uh, my own simulations. For example, um, someone said running longer tests first give a quicker regression. Um, I wrote a simulation for it, um, extracted real simulation run times, and checked it um, all in Jupyter Notebook. And yes, it does, but it's not all that much uh, of a gain over a random uh, list. And the random list actually gives you other benefits. You can write your own tools. Um, as tense test grounds, counts grew, um, we were running overnight regressions, but um, the ranking was taken till lunchtime. Um, I developed a, a ranking algorithm in uh, Python. Um, I had some mock coverage data, and when I expanded it to the kind of size of the data we had at work, 
Um, it was a lot faster than the times we were getting at work. So uh, in the end, um, I actually um, convinced management and made changes so we could actually slot it in. Uh, and so we got our ranking times right down. And Python is fast. Um, it's, it's a lot faster than a lot of people would have, you think, if they're, uh, especially if they're static uh, uh, programming um, language uh, aficionados. Um, other things I've written is uh, an RTL fault simulator. Uh, customer had a problem. We thought it was hard, it was intractable, but um, we came up with a solution of having an RTL level fault simulator. So we then had to um, add to a normal simulator to turn it into an RTL fault simulator. And all that, uh, well, most of that coding was done in Python, uh, a bit of TCL. Uh, inside the tool itself. Um, and ISO 26262, um, a lot of uh, tool validation needs to be done. Um, and you, you have to automate doing it, whatever it is, for, for two tools uh, uh, in two ways and comparing the results. And um, the kind of things you can do in Python, such as um, extracting data from a uh, PDF of an ASIC data book, um, get the expressions, create a truth table, calculate uh, um, gate, um, sorry, fault equivalences, and then apply the fault equivalences to your fault results. That was all done in Python, and it was done very quickly as well because uh, it's not part of the plan. We just had to make sure that uh, the, tool, the tool was working. <laughs> Um, yeah, there is that statement, you can write good code in any language. Um, but writing good code is heavily enshrined in the community. We've got the concept of being Pythonic, using Python in, um, in a good way rather than in any way. Uh, rather than say, I use example for uh, Perl, which is there's more than one way of doing it. But Perl isn't a bad language, it's just the language I've just mentioned. Um, you've also got uh, the Zen of Python. Uh, if you type in import this on the command line or have that other program, it will give you the set, the Zen of Python, which is um, good reading, should read it. <laughs> um, again, a lot of um, people that know how to program in static languages seem to think that scripting language is you know, a, a bad thing. Uh, but a scripting language can do a hell of a lot. Uh, being dynamic, they embrace change, and so much of what we do is changing. Uh, we, um, when we start, we have a problem, but we don't know the full extent of the problems. So actually having something that's dynamic means that you can, um, you can work towards a solution without having to go through the, um, uh, the, the compile step, which is always, you know, it's kind of a death now. Um, Python isn't just OO, it's multi-paradigm. Um, everything in Python under the, under, under the hood is um, an object, but OO isn't everything. You can actually write in the procedural and functional styles as well. Uh, you don't have to wrap your, your program um, in an OO solution. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, things don't lend themselves to OO solutions. You can do it, or you don't have to. And it's easy to learn, that's why we're gaining uh, traction. Uh, a lot of universities uh, have decided to uh, teach Python rather than Java because you know, hello world is print hello world. You don't have to worry about uh, setting up an object and all this kind of crap. It's easy to learn, it's compact, but it has a comprehensive standard library. And that means that the library, you don't have to bring it into your program. It's, if you're not using something in the library, it's not there. If you're not using regular expressions, it's not part of the syntax, for example, but it is there as a library. Um, and this compartmentalization means that you can keep your engineering in your head as well as Python, because you know, you've got an engineering problem to solve. Python tends to not get in the way of that. Um, 
that's what the scientists say as well for the problems with where they're using Python. Uh, and it can be embedded in other tools, like TCL can, and it can have other tools embedded in it, like Google TensorFlow library, that's embedded in Python. Um, when you want to train, you train via Python. Um, Python has um, interfaces to CUDA libraries, for example, uh, it's, and it supports the writing of large as well as small applications. Um, I don't know, I always think that Java tends to have large applications for everything. It's just the way they, the mentality it seems. And it's fast, I'll say that again, it's fast. What could be next for Python in verification? Big data is already in Python. Uh, AI is already in Python. Um, if we had our, our EDA data wrapped to actually have a Python interface, then it would make it much easier for when we have to uh, use big data or AI solutions. Um, we can wrap um, things written in lots of languages. Um, TCL is a great language, and it's already there in, in EDA tools, but it lies too far away from the C-like kind of norm. Um, it's time for EDA tools to embed Python so they can gain access to Python's rich library of tools, and it's all for, also time for, for them to be embedded in Python so that um, from Python you can actually use it as a service. As a, I'm talking to the cadence uh, engineer about um, then there's Jupyter Notebook. Just look it up online. It's, there are over a million um, Jupyter Notebooks on uh, GitHub at the moment. Um, you can, oh, here's um, LIGO, the uh, gravitational waves. That's a Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook of uh, some of the data. You, it's, it can be made live, so you can go in there and say, oh, I don't like the axes, whatever, change the axes. It'll show you a new graph that kind of thing, it, and we should be moving in, we should be in that environment too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. I had a, a quick question. You mentioned um, about doing coverage on uh, interfaces. Yes. Is there a library in Python for hooking up into the simulator to extract coverage on an interface, for example? Um, there, um, well, no. They're normally, coverage databases have C interfaces. I'm thinking okay. that EDA companies should give you, should go the extra step and give you a Python interface for it. So it so can you be used in. So how would you extract coverage on an interface using Python? Well, if you've got the coverage database. Oh, from the coverage database. From the coverage database. Okay. Yeah. Can it can it hook into a live simulation Python? Yes. Okay. So yes, you can use it via the um, normal way that you get. DPI. This. DPI, yes. Okay, so you could hook up to the DPI and get information about yes. the simulation as it goes. Okay, any more questions for Paddy? Yeah. I'd just be interested to know if you, if you know of any good um, VHDL or Verilog parsing tools in Python. That's often a challenge that we're the interested one, in solving. The major one that's used by most um, small EDA startups, they just, um, uh, oh, it begins with a V, but they've, they, they had a Python interface, and they've just bought a better Python interface from a third-party company is now being supported by them. And what they, the other third-party interface gave you was the same uh, kind of interface to both VHD and Verilog parsers from the V or... Say it begins with the uh, verification. Terrific, yes. Terrific. Oh, yes. All right, okay. Yes. Commercial. That's commercial. Yeah. yeah. But then again, you know, oh. there's, there's, there's room for commercial as in... in, yeah. in, in okay. I mean, well. If there was one that was freely available, I, I wasn't sure if, if you were aware of one. But uh, I'm not aware of one. No. Okay. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. 